Hi, this is Dr. Jed McCosco at academicinfluence.com and Wake Forest University. And we have a great interview for you today. Professor Tom Belstor from UC Irvine, one of the leading anthropologists of today. He's going to be talking about how uh, COVID-19 has affected education. And in particular, he's going to be showing us inside of his special uh, teaching place in Second Life. So I think you'll really enjoy this interview. For the people who are interview or watching this interview that um, we are going to edit together at the end, I just want to explain to everybody that what you've just been witnessing these past few minutes is a tour through the world that Professor Tom has created for his students so that he can teach them in a great virtual environment during the pandemic. Now, my first question to you, Professor Tom, is... Uh, what did you do before the pandemic? Did you use this world for any of your teaching? You know, I never um, had, and I can actually send you a, a, a link. Um, and here I'm gonna um, pull out from under you um, your chair because Kyle's sitting here, so we can sit, okay. sit here. Well, thank you for pulling circle. me out. Just so so now I can kind of move around. Seat. Okay, um, yeah. So, and Kyle can look around as he wants to, but I actually never okay. really did teaching in Second Life before. I just did my research here. And then, you know, once the epidemic started and, and students were so tired of Zoom all the time, um, we actually did it partially in Zoom as well. Um, okay. But, um, but we, this, doing it here just gave us a way to do something a little bit different and also give a space for the students to have some downtime where they could hang out with each other, or watch a movie together inside of Second Life because you can stream YouTube. Um, a few of them actually did some building. I can show you some things. There's a roller okay. coaster on the island, you know, some other things like that. So it really was just... Um, as sort of making the most of a bad situation. And this upcoming year, unfortunately, I'm gonna be uh, teaching several other, two, at least two other classes on this island because of the pandemic. And it just gives us a way to do something a little different than we would be doing otherwise. Wow, well, I can definitely see why you have risen to the top of our influence metric in terms of anthropologists. And maybe while we're sitting here, I, I'm very cozy with you here on the couch. Sorry about yes, that. You I didn't can, know. If you, to... <laughs> uh, you we can change the animations. Yes, the, the, there are cuddle animations. I'm like right on like top that. of you. It's perfectly uh, fine. But here, I'll sit in the rocking chair and then. Okay, then can, there we go. I that sounds cool. A little bit. Oh, that way. Oh, I'm that's very cool. Cl I can clever. rock quietly. Okay, yes, so can, I, th yeah. I think that um, my, my main question is how did you figure out? Um, that you wanted to be an anthropologist? Like at what point in your life did you decide, I want to be an anthropologist? And then from there, how did you decide that this would be your area of anthropology? So I started out um, doing research in Indonesia and my first two books are on about gay and lesbian Indonesians. And I, I came to that research in the 1990s doing HIV AIDS work in the United States and then just got really interested in what was it like to be gay in other parts of the world because I'm gay. And so that, you know, I had that, those interests and sort of through a random series of events as often happens, I, I got very involved in Indonesia. I had done some international HIV consulting in Russia and Malaysia before, but got very interested in Indonesia and then ended up, you know, doing the typical anthropology thing in a sense, um, learning the lang Indonesian language, spending a lot of time there, sort of looking at how this identity that seems very Western gay um, ends up halfway around the world in a country that's 90% Muslim um, and what it means for people there in their everyday lives. And so that was sort of the basic idea behind that research to which I devoted many years of my life and have written two books and many articles. And I still do um, a little bit of work in Indonesia, but um, almost 15 years now uh, ago, I had been doing research there for about 15 years. Um, <clears throat> and I decided that I wanted to do something different, which, you know, many anthropologists do. Some of us spend our entire career studying one culture, but often every five or 10 years, people will move on to new projects just to keep things fresh and, and learn about something new. And I was sort of in that uh, mindset. I wanted to push myself and, and try something new. And so I had the idea, um, I had always been interested in technology and mass media uh -huh. were actually very important to how Indonesians were getting these ideas
ideas of gay and lesbian. So I had a prior interest in technology. And so I had heard about virtual worlds, and this is 16 years ago now. They were just starting. Yeah, I, I saw you've idea. been a member for 16 years in uh, I've been first, in Second Life in Second for 16 Life. years, yeah. Wow. When I started, there were, there were only 2,000 people in Second Life. It had only opened about 10 months earlier. And the, wow. the idea that I basically had was, um, what happens if I try to use the sort of classical anthropological, anthropological techniques that you use to study another culture like on Java or Bali or whatever, and use it to try and study something like Second Life. Will it work or not? And what would you learn? So I, I started in a very open-ended kind of um, experimental way because there hadn't been a whole lot of ethnographic, you know, anthropological studies of online cultures yet at that point. There were some before me for sure. Um, but there hadn't been a whole bunch. And so it really began as an experiment. And then it was a big success. I found out uh -huh. that I could do participant observation, just like we're hanging out right here. I could hang out with people and play games and go to, you know, a dance or people do, you know, dance, you know, music here, or all kinds of things uh -huh. in these virtual worlds. And um, I was able to sort of use basically the same techniques we use in the physical world to study a virtual world. And then I've ended up writing, um, you know, my book, Coming of Age and Second Life. I've done a book about methods. I just finished up a book about disability and uh, a research project about disability in virtual worlds for which I've written yeah. several articles. And now I'm, I, and then I was sort of thinking of moving on away from Second Life actually to new research projects, but I've been sucked back in because of COVID. And so I now yeah. have a new National Science Foundation research project looking at what's happening in virtual worlds when so many people are coming to them because of the pandemic. And mm. I'm doing that with three of my graduate students here in Second Life, but also in Animal Crossing, which is a virtual world in Nintendo Switch that only got released in March. So it's very associated with the pandemic. It's got millions of people in it. And so we're sort of comparing it and Second Life um, and sort of thinking about, you know, what we call social distancing is really physical distancing. We could cuddle on this couch like we just were yeah, and not we were have to worry close. about COVID. And so how are virtual worlds sort of giving us ways to think about um, intimacy and closeness and, and, and sort of social activity in different ways? And, and how could we, we leverage that? How is it different than Facebook or Twitter or email? Um, what are, how are virtual worlds different? Because we could be doing this over Zoom. We yeah. could be sending Facebook things, but there's something different about being in a physical space where we are, you know, where we're in an environment. And so what does that mean, right? What, for social yes. interaction. I know I have a roller coaster on this island we could be riding or whatever. So um, yeah. that's the basic idea. And so it, it really um, has, you know, I think like many anthropologists, our, our work is a mix of opportunity and sort of long standing intellectual interests. And there's definitely been plenty of both of those in my life. Wow. Well, I'm just going to um, pause for a second in our interview to make sure that all the audio is working because I was hearing it. Okay, good. Because I, I was hearing an echo and I slid my master volume down and I thought, oh my gosh, I hope that didn't throw everything off. So thank you, uh, Professor Tom. Um, you know, there's many questions, uh, <clears throat> but I think we'll just focus on this, this aspect of going back into Second Life as a result of COVID. Uh, you obviously stayed in Second Life, even though you were planning on moving away from it um, because of COVID. And you said a lot of people are going into virtual worlds. Is Second Life one of those places where there are many more people than there were before COVID? And by the way, the reason there was a, a I paused there for a moment for your speaker. You can uh, I turned it I turned my sound off while you were talking to avoid any danger of it. Ah, so it just okay. means it, it takes me a moment to click it back on. But you can do oh, okay. that as well um, for the sake of the audio quality. Just click off okay. your little microphone when you're not talking. Um, OK, so for it, it's hard to know for sure, but it looks like there's been like a you know, like a 15, 20% increase at least in people okay. active in Second Life in terms of active accounts. It's hard to tell for sure because getting a Second Life account is like a Gmail account. You can get as many as you want. <clears throat> um, 
but looking at what's called concurrency, like how many people are in Second Life at once, um, it's gone up, not hugely, but it's gone up like around 20%. And there are sort of groups and activities that are happening about sort of now that we have to stay at home. So one, mm -hmm. one thing that we're doing in the comparison is looking at a place like Second Life that it's, it's definitely grown because of the pandemic, but not hugely versus Animal Crossing, which didn't exist before the pandemic. Um, and so there's a lot of mm -hmm. evidence that, you know, even if you're looking at online games uh, like Fortnite or yes. whatever, they're, they're all seeing growth and those companies okay. are seeing a lot of profit. So, which isn't surprising. And Zoom and basically everything online is in a growth phase right now, right? Apple had a record quarter despite the pandemic because mm. obviously... Mm -hmm people are going online um, a lot more than they were um, before. And so but that part of what sense. I'm interested in the research is not just people doing it more, but doing it differently or what's what's happening differently. So, for instance, one sort of early research finding that we're finding just in the last couple months, having started this research very suddenly, that's sort of interesting is there's definitely uh, cases a lot of cases of people coming into Second Life or into Animal Crossing to be left alone. So coming oh. into an island like this one that we're on right now, where there's no other avatars around and just walking around to look at the trees or ride a boat on the water or just sort of fly around. And so in some cases, because of the epidemic, people are in their homes, maybe with four brothers and sisters and their parents or with a husband and wife or a lot of people. And they actually are not isolated in a way. They actually have people around them all the time and they want to get away and be alone and they can't do it. Maybe they're in an apartment with a wow. family. And so people are going into Animal Crossing or Second Life or some of these other things. Sometimes they're doing it because they're lonely and they want connection. But sometimes mm. it's the opposite. Sometimes it's that they want to be alone. And if they go on Facebook, you're not alone. You're reading about everyone's stuff. But there's a lot of beautiful sort of islands in Second Life and Animal Crossing that you can just go into and you can purposely find one where there's no one else around um, wow. <laughs> so that you can just sort of have some quiet time on a beach. And so is the, it's interesting in that sense that, you know, the assumption often is that going online is a way to connect. But for some people, going online during the epidemic is a way to disconnect. It's a way to get away from other human beings, at least some of yeah. the time. Now, now I, I would never have guessed that. But after you're, let's say, on a deserted beach um, and enjoying yourself, isn't there sort of that urge to tell somebody about what kind of fun you just had or what kind of relaxation you just had to share that moment with yeah. somebody? So how do you see that playing out in, in what you're describing? Sure, um, because it's not either or. Like it's not that you don't that doing one means you don't do the other. So um, mm -hmm. often people like in, in Animal Crossing, there's apps like iPhone or Android apps where you can tell people about your island and what you're doing on it, or websites where you can do that, or you can actually I am your friends inside of Animal Crossing like you can in Second Life and tell people about the cool island you were just at yesterday. You should go check it out too. So yeah, it yeah. doesn't have to be. There's not a, a one size fits all kind of thing, and it, and it doesn't have to be either or. It could be that one yeah. evening, you know, it could be in the afternoon I want to be alone, and maybe in the evening I want company. So, yes. so that absolutely can happen. It's not. And now that said, there are cases of people who come into these places probably only to be alone. There's probably cases of people who come in only to socialize. But there's also a lot of mixing, right? Where people might, mm -hmm. as the mood fits them, do one or do do the other. And actually, in a virtual world like Second Life you could have as many avatars as you want. So you have your Jed avatar right there. Yes. You, could, you could for free get another right avatar, just like you have two Gmail accounts. And so we know there's cases where people will have two avatars and one they don't tell other people about. They don't friend anyone else. And that's the I want to be alone avatar. Ah, and then the other avatar, they have all these lists of friends and groups they belong to. And often people will do that. They'll have an avatar for when they want to be left alone. Um, you know, sometimes they'll call it a building avatar. Because the thing about Second Life is that you can sort of build in real time and with other people. Like I just made oh, this box. Wow, that's cool. You, I, so you can <laughs> sort of, you know, the way you build stuff in Second Life is you can just sort of do it in real time and you can sort of do it collaboratively. But if you want to be left alone when you're building, you might have one 
you know, avatar that you use for um, building and another avatar that you use for socializing, right? So it's, you know, it's that kind of thing that you will sometimes um, see people doing. So there's, you know, there's a range of, a range of ways that people um, use these things. You know, very rarely is it a one size fits all kind of situation. Yes. Well, I appreciate you you talking about all of this stuff. And I could just picture somebody finding a really uh, picturesque spot like your island, which is so scenic, um, and going there alone. And and then maybe, can you do this in Second Life? Take a selfie of yourself at some quaint spot? Oh, yeah. And, there's, there's, okay. <laughs> there's people with whole Flickr or Instagram accounts completely devoted to their um, photographic journeys around, you know, Second Life or, or in Animal Crossing as well. So yeah, there's lots wow. of that. Um, there's lots of that kind of thing. So exactly, that's another way that people can, you know, save things is they can, they can blog things, but they can yeah. also, um, they can also take pictures or do that kind of thing if they, if they want to do that. So yeah, there's, there's definitely those kinds oh, of... Oh, very um, cool. Now you're sitting up there. <laughs> now I'm sitting on the box I made. Yes, I'm do, doing a little very building cool. while I'm talking. But That's yeah, you, people amazing. do that kind of thing um, as well, for sure. So yeah, it's, and so yeah, that's something. So basically both in terms of this research project I'm doing and, and in terms of my teaching, it's sort of, you know, finding a silver lining in a, in a difficult situation to use the virtual world stuff for teaching, but also mm -hmm. um, to sort of study what's, what's, what's happening um, in these spaces well, because of the epidemic. Yeah. Well, since we did the interview completely backwards from what I was uh, predicting, why don't we end on your career path? So you mentioned how you got into uh, anthropology in general. But for example, where were you 16 years ago when you first started this project? Were you at uh, University of California, Irvine, or were you somewhere else? Were you recruited there? Tell us a little bit about your trajectory and what you think allows you to be one of the most influential anthropologist in the world? Um, well, so I finished my PhD in uh, 2000. And, okay. um, and then, you know, as many of us are, are on the job market for a couple years uh, doing mm -hmm. that, you know, trying to find a job. And, um, and in 2002, I was very lucky to get the job at UC Irvine and okay. uh, in incredibly lucky because my husband, Bill Maurer, is also was already, had just been hired there a couple years before. And, mm. you know, in in the academic life, it's very difficult for couples to get jobs at the same place. That's a very, mm -hmm. very nice thing when that happens um, and you don't take that for granted. And so 16 years ago, I was exactly where I am now. I've been at Irvine since um, 2002 because I've been like, you know, we've been lucky enough to get positions together, but also we have a really wonderful department at, at UC Irvine and a very um, open, welcoming department in the sense that when I you know, told my department, oh, I'm going to shift from Indonesia to this crazy stuff of online. No one said, oh, you can't do that. You have oh, to good. keep doing what you did before. Um, you know, we're a very open department in that we, you know, let people do whatever they they want to do to sort of follow their bliss or follow what, the, you know, their intellectual mm -hmm. curiosity. And so I've been very fortunate to be in a department where I was very supported in terms of you know, uh, doing something different than I had done before. And I'm by far, and many of us in the department have careers like that. And so I was very um, lucky in that, that regard, but yeah, mm. my, 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 my career trajectory is not that interesting in that sense in terms of jobs, because I've had the same job. I've, I, well, I've moved up in my, you know, I've been promoted, but I've been that, yes. in the same, same position, uh, yes. the same department since 2002, because, uh, yeah. because we really like it there. And like I said, um, to, to get jobs in the same place is not something that you No, it's not uh, easy take, at all. In fact, take for granted. Yeah. Yes, very much so. I, I have been in the same job since 2004, and I am very grateful for my own position. And it sounds like you've found a really good place. Um, there are so many things that we could talk about, Tom. And I just really want to thank you for taking time to show us your island. Uh, we started this interview with a, a grand tour uh, I don't know if you want to end it with uh, a, another grand tour of something else that you want to show us, uh, or if we. Uh... Um, oh, yes. sure. I can just take a couple uh, minutes. Um, 
what would you, um, like on a different island, you mean, or like? No, I, I, I was just wondering if you wanted to bookend it with two tours. But honestly, I think the most important thing is <laughs> we will start end the interview with what I should have started with, which was to introduce you. Um, <laughs> bo both you in the, the image that we're going to see on the video screen. Uh, I don't know if you can see me waving to you in real life here. Okay. No, I can't, but hopefully oh. you can see me. So. Okay, I can see you. So, You're seeing so, me. Yeah, we're seeing you. And in, with the magic of editing, I'm sure that people will think that we're looking at each other That's right. <laughs> in our That's screens. Right. Uh, but yeah, so this uh, today we have with us uh, a professor from University of California, Irvine, Professor Tom. Now, uh, how do you say your last name? Belstorff. The first O is silent. It's, it's Okay, Belstorff. Yeah. yeah, Belstorff. Well, my last name is sometimes hard to say, too. So Belstorff, Professor Tom Belstorff. And in uh, the virtual world that we were just in, uh, Professor Tom is known as Professor Tom Bukowski. Is that how your, your students refer to you as? Um, sometimes, yes. That, okay. the, the way Second Life is set up, especially in the early years, you had to choose a last name from a list. You couldn't choose your oh. own name. So I chose oh, okay. a long name that started with a letter B. So Ah, okay. So and you've had it for 16 years. So that, that's I very have. cool. I've had it for 16 years. That's right. Okay. Well, and then just were you surprised at all that you are one of the most influential anthropologists? Or have you known for a while that both you... Um, and some of the other people that we've been interviewing are up on that list. Um, I mean, I'm surprised and flattered and not, not quite sure I really am. I mean, I mean, it's, it's always really nice to have one's work cited and recognized, but I always think of anthropology as a team effort. And I, I do a lot of co-authoring and collaborating um, with other people. So, you know, for me, it's uh, about a community of scholars and researchers that, is, you know, we're helping each other and working together to, to, you know, address problems in the world and to understand uh -huh. the human condition in new ways. And so, um, you know, I'm always happy when, you know, with regard to my work in Indonesia or in Second Life or anywhere, um, it's recognized or people find it useful. That's, you know, a really awesome. I really like that. But, you know, my work only exists because of so many other people um, before me and alongside me who are doing really interesting and important work that I cite and, and engage with and build on. So, mm -hmm. you know, for me, it's always flattering to be, to be uh, recognized, but it's also about us working together. I mean, to me, I, that's what it means to be part of a science, right? A kind of scientific right. endeavor it's, is that it's, it's really not about uh, individuals. I mean, it is in a sense, but it's, it's also about a community of people working together. Exactly. Well, thank you, Tom, for enjoying this time together and uh, for giving welcome. us your, your thoughts about anthropology. And we look forward to being back in touch with you when this interview gets uploaded to the website. And if there's anything else that we can talk about at that point, it'll be fun. So thank you for your time. You're very welcome. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.